Then last, but certainly not least, a talk from Daniel Finneran, Senior Manager of Developer Relations at Equinix Metal, who will go under the hood of Tinkerbell to detail the technologies that power it, some of the functionality that enables bare metal servers to now deploy in seconds, and finally, how we're extending Tinkerbell and the cloud native space through cluster API. Good day. Uh, thank you very much for joining uh, this talk today, all around Tinkerbell. Um, my name is Dan Finneran. Um, I'm currently part of the DevRel engineering team at Equinix Metal, um, where I spend a lot of my time working on bare metal provisioning, um, various networking projects all around kind of Kubernetes and bare metal, um, and a variety of other kind of infrastructure-based um, projects. Um, Thank you for coming to this talk today. This talk is all going to be around the uh, open source project Tinkerbell. Um, so we're going to be doing some demos, showing some live provisioning, uh, and a number of other things. The agenda today uh, is going to be the following. So we're effectively um, going to talk a little bit around where Tinkerbell came from, uh, what Tinkerbell actually is. We'll do a live demo of provisioning from one operating system to another. We'll discuss some of the cloud native tooling that we're using um, as part of uh, making life easier for people who want to make use of Tinkerbell. And then we'll discuss the roadmap a little bit as well in terms of some of the things that we're working on um, and some of the things that um, we have kind of in the pipeline at the moment. So uh, Tinkerbell. So um, Tinkerbell was open sourced over a year or so ago. Um, it came from the company formerly, formerly known as Packet, uh, now known as Equinix Metal. And fundamentally, um, the, the people at Packet had um, put in you know, a lot of work into generating and building um, a platform that handled uh, all of the bare metal servers that they advertise to the you know to the um, to their customers uh, as bare metal as a service. Um, it became kind of clear that this was uh, something fantastic that they'd built, and um, it would be really good to share this with the community, um, and you know kind of get build a community all around kind of bare metal uh, as a service and and layering on things on top of all of that. So, as I mentioned, Tinkerbell was open sourced over a year or so ago. Um, and there has been a lot of work kind of put into generalizing Tinkerbell for um, different types of servers, more end users, supporting different architectures, um, things from Raspberry Pis up to large, uh, you know, kind of big iron and things like that. Um, and then a lot of work into building out more um, kind of more tools, more opportunities, more kind of bits uh, in the ecosystem for people to actually make use of all the way down to kind of some of the work that we're doing now around kind of the uh, Kubernetes cluster API projects, which um, we are working on a provider called CAPT or cluster API Tinkerbell, which effectively will allow uh, in the same way that um, using cluster API AWS to provision a Kubernetes cluster within uh, AWS, uh, a customer could use uh, Cluster API Tinkerbell to provision Kubernetes clusters on bare metal. And Tinkerbell would be the engine there that, that takes case of doing all of those provisioning steps and getting your Kubernetes cluster on bare metal. So uh, that kind of gives a quick overview in terms of what Tinkerbell is and, and sorts of the, some of the sorts of things that we're, we're actually looking at. Um, what actually is Tinkerbell? So, well, you know, if you download it and try and use it, uh, what, what actually, it, uh, you know, are the constituent parts and things like that? So um, Tinkerbell is effectively a, a workflow engine in that um, it is, uh, you know, kind of client server um, based, but the, the main point really is that it is a engine designed to execute a series of actions on a remote host. Um, in most circumstances, those actions will be kind of doing things like operating system provisioning. Uh, Tinkerbell is built from a number of microservices. Um, and one of the key benefits really around all of this is that it becomes very easy for people to take bits of the Tinkerbell stack that they want to make use of um, and you know, kind of chop and change and, and basically build a, a stack that works for them. Kind of key examples of this really are uh, people that don't want to make use of um, a component known as Boots, which provides the DHCP functionality, 
they could remove that and you know, kind of make use of their own DHCP that they're actually running in-house. Um, we're looking at, uh, there's a number of proposals around changing various bits of Tink server uh, or swapping out one Tink server for another that effectively will sit on top of Kubernetes uh, or sit within Kubernetes as such. This would allow, um, as you use uh, the Tink CLI or the Tink API, objects that you create are actually going to be Kubernetes objects and things like that. So there's there's a lot of different ways that people can take the stack and make it their own um, for their own sorts of use cases. Um, and then not only is the, the kind of Tink stack, there's also additional tooling uh, that we've put together. Um, some of this tooling allows an end user to create operating system images. And I'll kind of talk about that a little bit more uh, later on. Um, some of the tooling that we've put together um, allows an end user to modify the in-memory operating system that, that does the provisioning work. Uh, the reason why this is important is that um, we want to make it easy for end users to build kernels that have the drivers for their specific hardware and things like that. They don't want to have to rely on us. They can take uh, the project known as Hook that provides that functionality, add in the drivers that they want. Um, do a make, and effectively they will then be given their own um, in-memory operating system that has all of the bits that they need, including support for their own platforms, their own hardware, and their own infrastructure. Some of the work that we've been doing recently um, has been to put together kind of a, a growing collection of these Tinkerbell actions. Now, as I mentioned, um, Tinkerbell actions are what are executed on the remote host. So these are effectively um, container images that are pulled at runtime and executed on the remote host. There's a number of uh, actions in here that will take care of effectively writing an operating system onto that infrastructure. Other actions will install bootloaders or uh, modify the underlying file system and things like that. Uh, we've put together a lot of tooling that um, makes it easier for uh, end users to build their own operating system images. So um, we are leaning kind of quite heavily into the use of Packer. Um, what we've done is kind of wrap um, a lot of uh, scripting and things like that around the Packer engine, uh, Packer tooling, to make it easier for an end user. So effectively, we you know have a tool called Crocodile, which uh, following with the Tinkerbell naming, um, you can effectively get the, the Crocodile uh, repo, clone it, and run it, and it will do all of the tasks that it needs to do to get your operating systems actually built and provisioned. Kind of the key core tenants behind this really are um, we don't want to be building operating systems for everybody. We effectively want to be giving you the bare bones bits that you need um, in order to take this, modify it, build your own operating system images. Um, and you know th that's kind of the, the core points here. Um, one other thing, the, the crocodile has a fast mode for testing as well. So if you do use that, the, the crocodile will go red. And the, the kind of the key points here really are we can build these operating system images in around four minutes and then get them deployed very quickly onto bare metal servers. And then some of the additional tooling um, that we you know kind of heavily lean on. Um, one of which is, as I mentioned, you know, we can take the Tink stack and you can do what you need to do with it. Um, we've recently replaced kind of the in-memory operating system that we that we make use of. Um, originally, the, the tooling was uh, a piece of software called OC, which was in-house. It's It does the job, but it's, it's very uh, opinionated towards packet slash Equinix Metal. So to make it easier for end users, we uh, leveraged the Linux kit project from Docker. Uh, this allows us to provision and build an operating system very quickly for different architectures uh, and deploy different drivers and things like that. Um, some of the work that we've been doing recently is allowing uh, these operating system images that we're talking about to be stored in Docker registries. So uh, ORAS, which is um, or OCI registry of storage, we can make use of this tool to effectively allow us to push a full operating system into a container registry, we get all of the benefits then of, of kind of container registries. So um, scaling across multiple areas, are back in terms of who can pull what image and things like that. Um, we rely quite heavily on the Docker engine. So the Docker engine is inside the in-memory operating system. And as I mentioned, 
that is basically taking care of executing the workflows on those remote hosts. And also, as I mentioned, um, Packer, we um, make heavy use of as part of our OS build pipeline. So um, that's kind of a quick overview into kind of some of the tooling bits. Um, let's actually kind of step through uh, what it is like to actually deploy um, using using Tinkerbell. So um, moving away from you know kind of the the slow and kind of meticulous process of getting operating systems deployed at the moment, um, we're going to show you what it's like to use kind of operating system images and deploy using some of those actions um, that I mentioned. So I will just minimize this. So um, we have here uh, a piece of bare metal. Uh, this is a Nook that has a Windows 2019 deployed on it at the moment. Uh, I deployed this um, about five minutes or so ago. Um, we can see here I use the Tink workflow. I've created a workflow um, using a particular template. So we can see here. Um, these are all of the templates that already exist on my host. We'll remove this existing workflow here. Uh, this was a workflow that I created, which was going to deploy the Windows 2009 template on there. Um, we will do a different template. So this has created a new workflow using this template here to this particular device. Um, that we're going to make use of. And I'll explain a little bit in a little bit more detail what's actually happening under the covers. But if I now ask this machine to reboot from the network, we should start to see this machine reprovision. So effectively, what is going to happen here? We can see the machine is now uh, power cycled uh, back to the BIOS. It's now going to start to boot up from the network. And we can see that happening now. And what is happening now is the in-memory operating system hook is now being uh, loaded over the network. Um, and that will start up in a few seconds or so. So we should see the Docker Linux kit whale. There it is. So what's actually happening now is um, uh, the Docker containers that power uh, the various actions are actually running in the background. Um, we are provisioning an operating system directly to the persistent storage in this particular machine. And in another 10 seconds or so, we should see this process finish. So we'll just give it a few more seconds to finish writing this operating system to the machine. There we go. We can see that that's actually happened. So that was 51 seconds or so to provision this operating system um, onto this bit of infrastructure. And in a few seconds or so, there we go. So um, one thing that we didn't show or what we did there, we didn't actually reboot the machine. We used a functionality known as uh, kexec. Uh, and I'll detail that in a little bit more. Uh, I'll, I'll cover that in a little bit more detail shortly. But effectively, um, we've within a minute we have effectively paved over the existing operating system with a brand new one, and we've now booted into that operating system. So that is kind of a quick example in terms of how quick um, and you know kind of how the functionality actually works with Tinkerbell to get an operating system provisioned on bare metal. So how does Tinkerbell actually work? So as we've just kind of shown, um, a machine, when it is told to boot from the network and is powered on, it will join the network, but it has no identity. So it effectively will start up and ask the network, who am I, what should I actually be doing? This is where kind of Tinkerbell comes in. So uh, Tinkerbell uh, server um, and all of its constituent parts would be deployed in this instance. We input into Tink server through either the CLI or the API uh, information about that physical piece of infrastructure and then a workflow that we actually want to deploy on that machine. And uh, a workflow is a list of actions that will be performed. So now with Tinkerbell actually aware of both the infrastructure and what to do with that infrastructure, when that machine goes to the network and asks, who am I? Uh, Boots, which is the networking component of Tinkerbell, will 
speak to that server through technologies known as DHCP to give it an address on the network. It will use TFTP to start sending over information to that server. And then HTTP will be used to pull hook, uh, which is the in-memory operating system down and loaded into memory where the next set of processes will actually occur. So at this point on that server, we've pulled all of the bits that we need to do. Um, in this case, uh, the server is running a hook, not OC, but they largely do the same thing. And inside that in-memory operating system is the Tink worker. And the Tink worker's role then is to go back to the Tink server and ask what workflow should I actually be running? At which point the Tink server will reply where these are the containers uh, that you should be running in parallel. These are the actions that should be performed. And in the example that we just showed, um, the actions did things like download this operating system from a web server, write it to this particular piece of persistent storage inside the machine, and then reboot or kernel exec, or you know there could be actions that add SSH keys and do a variety of other things. So much like kind of Neo in the matrix, we can effectively stream an operating system into the brain, as it were, uh, in the same way that he learned Kung Fu. So that's kind of an overview in terms of how Tinkerbell actually works um, from a high level perspective in terms of, you know, we can send things over the network, we can write things to disk and do a variety of other things. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit in terms of some of the deployment technologies that we've actually been working on and show some of the newer things that we've, we've done recently. So um, there's a number of actions that are quite common. Uh, as I mentioned, we have, um, or neglected to mention even, we have a thing called the, uh, we make use of a thing called the Artifact Hub, which is a, a CNCF project, um, which uh, allows us to effectively host all of those actions. Um, it becomes easy for people to kind of query and, and you know, kind of same way that you would Google these things, uh, find actions that make sense for them to put together in their workflows. Uh, and three of the more, more common actions are image to disk, OCI to disk and archive to disk. Um, all of these actions have a similar sort of, of use case, um, but they use kind of a variety of different technologies in order to do that. So image to disk, uh, OCI to disk and archive to disk, they typically stream an operating system uh, from a remote location um, and write that content to a block device inside, the, inside a machine that's being provisioned. There's all of those post install actions. So they can do things like uh, modify the operating system or modify the disks, install bootloaders, modify files by writing things like SSH keys. Um, I do, they can do anything that you would need them to do. And then um, finally, we make heavy use of Kexec and Reboot. Um, once we've finished doing the previous two tasks, writing an operating system, customizing that operating system, we then need to boot into that operating system. And we can either do that through rebooting or looking at Kexec in order to, uh, to allow us to drop into that operating system. So um, the different X to disk actions, uh, image to disk will basically pull a operating system image uh, from a web server or a, a HTTP, HTTPS location. OCI to disk allows an end user to pull a OCI uh, image, uh, an OS image inside uh, a registry and stream that directly to disk. And then the final one will um, take a compressed uh, archive that it can access locally and write that directly to the file system. A little bit more detail kind of under the covers. Um, these operating system images typically are quite large. Um, mainly because they, in order for the operating system to be provisioned, we need to hit various requirements. For instance, um, to write Windows to an operating system disk, we need a 20 gig disk to begin with. So a lot of that space is largely ir irrelevant, unused, but it is a requirement of the installer. So using Packer, we need to create a 20 gig disk in order to install that operating system on. Um, as part of any uh, operating system, there's additional data that exists in the form of partitions. And then inside those partitions is the actual data files, uh, bootloaders, things that are actually um, used by user land and, and whatnot. That's all fine, but ultimately, 
all of that data is just zeros and ones. If we ignore files, if we ignore file systems, if we ignore partitions and just look at byte zero to byte 20 gig, it's a series of zeros and ones that make up the disk. So uh, we compress that, um, which gets us quite good savings in terms of how much data we need to transmit over the wire. Um, and these uh, X to disk actions can decompress on the fly. So we can send a full disk gzipped over the network where the, the, these disk actions will decompress them uh, on the host that they're, they're being provisioned to and then write the decompressed content directly to disk. Um, once it's finished doing that, it will inform um, the running kernel to rescan that particular physical device, where it will then see that those partitions now exist. Uh, and some additional work that we've been doing to improve um, the speed to all of this is in kind of intelligent zero skipping. So um, as I mentioned, um, a lot of the operating systems that we need to provision have large amounts of wasted space that isn't actually used. We can skip over that. And there's a reason why this is actually kind of quite useful. Um, if we're writing 20 gig every time we want to install a, an operating system, that's a lot of zeros that are actually being written to disk. Um, that is wear and tear. This is kind of quite uh, bad for things like Raspberry Pi. So if we can speed up or skip a lot of those write actions, we're effectively going to give you a lot more life for things like SD cards. And it dramatically speeds up the time to deployment as well. It's quite simple in the way that it works. Um, I think my face is obscuring a little bit of this, but effectively, um, as these actions read data from a location, whether that's a registry or a web server, um, and then they decompress that in chunks, we can look at those chunks, determine if that chunk is basically just a block of empty data. And if it is, we don't write that chunk to disk. We effectively then just move the, the next write 32 kilobytes on. Um, and that is effectively how it works. So we effectively just loop over and we do a no, no operation uh, in the event that we're not writing anything. Um, this is a relatively new thing we've implemented recently, but we're already seeing kind of massive savings in terms of how quickly we can deploy an operating system. So if we kind of skip here, we can see some examples. Let me move my head over here. So this is the image to disk action. Um, and we're kind of demoing here, running, uh, writing ESXi 7 to a block device. Um, compressed, this entire thing is 4.2 gig. Now, if we actually use the uh, zero disk, um, zero write uh, function, we can see here, even though 4.3 gig has been um, downloaded, um, only 3.9, uh, sorry, 3.9 of that didn't need actually writing, which effectively means only half a gig of the entire operating system actually contained anything pertinent. So we've saved a huge amount of time and data that needed writing to disk. We can see here that we went from 10 seconds to five seconds to write that operating system to the persistent storage. Uh, this is the same with Windows. If we look here, uh, a Windows 2019 raw disk uh, compressed uh, would be a 22 gig that needed writing to disk. However, if we do the zero write saving, 13 gig of that 22 didn't need writing again. So time saved and also a lot of time not writing um, to, to those disks themselves. And then the other thing that um, I, I mentioned on uh, was kexec. So kexec is a function that is Linux specific and it effectively allows an end user to replace uh, one running Linux kernel with another. How that typically works is you boot into one Linux kernel, um, have everything running, doing what you need to do. And using kexec, we effectively will load another kernel into a different part of memory of that server. And when we then do that kexec, we are effectively telling the existing running kernel to point to the brand new one and start from there. This effectively allows us to live boot into a freshly deployed operating system. We can do this with Linux and VMware, and there is work being done to enable this with Windows. So this is um, a very big server. Um, it's an Equinix Metal server that I made use of. I'm gonna quickly show now 
using those zero rights and K exec, how quickly we can get into ESXi. So um, ESXi, uh, sorry, um, we are now loading hook. Hook will take a few seconds to actually load. So 11 seconds, hook is now loading. We're now writing ESXi to a physical device inside the machine. We have done that in five seconds. In oh, eight seconds, we have now booted into that operating system and ESXi is now loading. So that was uh, 19 seconds from boot to install and then start a brand new operating system. In this case, uh, ESXi. On Linux, that could be even quicker. Um, but this is, um, at least in my opinion, kind of insane speeds um, in terms of getting things deployed on bare metal. When we start looking at things like cluster API for building up, you know, kind of large um, Kubernetes clusters and things like that, making use of this, we'll be able to build out large Kubernetes clusters uh, probably in minutes. So this is going to be very exciting um, to make use of uh, later down the line. Um, so we can see here. We've now nearly finished booting ESXi, and here we go. There we go. So um, this is a, a C3 medium, which is the, well, the kind of some of the larger servers. We can see here it's a 24-core uh, Dell server, so quite a chunky machine, um, and that's a minute to ESXi on bare metal. So some of the other things that we're toying with, um, UEFI boot, which allows us to k-exec into a bootloader as opposed to uh, a different kernel. This is what we're looking at using to allow us to boot into Windows. Um, signing of operating system images, uh, more operating systems as part of our build pipelines, uh, additions to hook to add in anything that people may want in the future. Um, yeah, and some actions that um, contain an application. So one of the things that we've actually seen some end users doing is almost kind of like VDI. Um, and what they've done is effectively um, put in things like uh, X11 uh, inside a, an action, sh uh, stream that to uh, to a, a, a remote host, and then boot that into um, boot that up as their kind of action. So, you know, kind of some examples that we've seen of this is um, uh, you know, kind of billboards and things such as that, where these machines boot from the network. They effectively send an action which will start X11, which will then display contents to an attached display. Um, so yeah, uh, that is a deep dive into uh, Tinkerbell, how it works, uh, some of the things that we've been looking at adding, um, and a few demos of how quick we can now get uh, things deployed on bare metal. With that, I'd like to say thank you very much. And if anybody does have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm at the BSD box on Twitter. Um, Tinkerbell has channels on the CNCF Slack. Um, yeah, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks to Microsoft Azure and Equinix Metal for supporting us at the champion level. We also want to thank Red Hat and Slim.ai for funding us at our supporter level.